Good evening, everybody. Here we are again. It's me, uh, Tarun Krishnadas, and uh, we're doing our regular Friday night live interview with uh, various guests. Over the last few weeks, we've had the privilege of having Mantra Chaitanya and Jai Marari, and um, we had Krishna Arjun last week, and this week we've got um, Virabhadra joining us. I see he's here right now. So let's just bring him onto your screen. So I sent you that and you should come up with us. Hopefully it'll be easier than last week when um, we had a whole nightmare with Krishna June. Okay, we go. Are you there? Yep. Can you hear me? Great. Nice. Hearing me loud and clear? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. So we had a funny episode today, right, um, Virabhadra? Well, let me just introduce you first. So Virabhadra is my friend. We've known each other. When was the first time we met? 2008. 2008. So I was just, well, after that, I moved to Hungary. And you got involved in the temple in, in London at that time. But I wasn't around for long. And then now we've reconnected since I've come back from Hungary. And... Um, Virabhadra is studying an MA in sustainable agriculture and food security. And he's also a director of the Bhakti Project. And uh, they're down here in Folkestone. We're constantly having arguments over which is better, Ashford or Folkestone. Although I think it's a losing argument from my side because he has the beach about 10 seconds away from his house. Um, and all we have to offer is the Ashford designer outlet. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, we're, today we're going to be speaking about society and if it will collapse, if it were to collapse, how would that happen? And what would the repercussions be? How could we prepare for that? And um, we were communicating today <laughs> and Virabhadra said that the electricity had gone out in their building and uh, he didn't know if he was going to do the interview and we were saying how relevant that was for the interview, right Vera? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, luckily came back on around three, I think, so we were all right. But, uh, yeah, it was funny because um, it went off and I was like, hmm, you know, I have to, like, get the gas camping stove out and, <laughs> you know, start thinking about, like, uh, is the water going to go? You know, all these little things that you just take for granted the whole time. The freezer, like, oh, is all the food going to go bad? How long is it going to be off for? I was thinking also about the... Um, in Texas recently, I don't know if anyone's been following that, how, uh, you know, they had that horrible winter storm and then the power just went out and I think a lot of the pipes and stuff froze. So they had no electricity or anything and no water in a lot of houses. And uh, God, yes, yeah, it's just like when uh, something like that happens, you realise how, you know, this technology is great that we have central heating, we have running tap water and everything, you know, it's, it's amazing. But uh, you realise how fragile it all is as well when um, just something little goes wrong. Like in our area, I think um, one of the main electric cables had exploded or something up the, I don't know where exactly, but uh, nearby. Um, but yeah, just something like that can happen. Um, you know, those kind of things aren't going to cause, they're not going to be the cause of society's collapse or anything. But um, yeah, they, they expose how vulnerable we actually are as a society. Um, when we are so dependent on technology without any natural resources at hand. You know, I live in an apartment, not so much out of choice, just financially. It makes a bit more sense. But, um, yeah, we've got no garden, can't grow anything anywhere. There's no, um, there's no fresh fruits and vegetables nearby that you can go and pick or anything. So, yeah, if everything did go to, or if, you know, everything fell apart, we'd be a bit screwed. I think I think pretty much everyone would as well. Um, anyway, let's... Uh... Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many points to discuss about it. And I think we're kind of having this conversation because we started talking about it a while ago. And it's like the kind of thing that you want to like sit down and like explore that, you know, what could happen? What are the repercussions of it? Because like you said, we're living such a kind of dependent life that we were living in a flat when we were in uh, Radlett near Watford and you're dependent in every single way. It's like 
your water supply you're totally dependent like if somebody were to turn your water supply off then it's then it's finished where you're going to get water from your food is coming from a local supermarket you don't have access to to your own food to growing your own food and if they just close the shop or as we experienced them during coronavirus then we i was going to the supermarket and it was like massive queues everybody mm-hmm. like being queuing had to queue 2 meters apart there's like full car parks so we were just going around the block Yeah. and when yeah. you got in there with no toilet paper there was no pasta there was no tomato sauce and a lot of things <laughs> were sold out like not that you're going to die here without these things but <laughs> fruits and vegetables as well if you went in the afternoon like people were going extremely early in the morning because everyone was panicking so we are and like electricity the electricity went off with you today but like you said you couldn't cook without electricity yeah. and everything is dependent upon electricity so I mean maybe you could just say something about that point if you like that if we seem to be living in a very dependent situation and maybe we don't even think about that Yeah like I mean I'll bring it to that point in a second like I think one thing I was thinking um the other day was just you know I think with the, with everything that's been going on over the last year it's easy to sometimes get a little bit kind of wrapped up in your head in kind of you know pessimistic thoughts Um so I was thinking about World War 2 and what people actually lived through then around the entire world it was just madness when you actually think about it like what people had to go through um you know that bomb in Exeter was just exploded the other day you know it's mm-hmm. made a huge explosion imagine like hundreds of them being dropped on your city over one night and um you know you people lived through that people got education through that you know they they had their education in those years like my you know people got evacuated you know you had to get separated from your parents and what not um so yeah what i was thinking is that they i don't think all right like nowadays if something on that caliber happened i think the the fallout the societal fallout from an event like that would be so much worse because we're so much more dependent on kind of the infrastructure of society. Mm-hmm. Uh in those days, you know, there was the whole dig for Britain and everything. People still knew how to grow fruits and vegetables and everything. And nowadays, I think you only have to like grow a few things in your garden to realize that actually it's it's there's some skill to it. It's not just shove it in the ground, sun and water like you were told in primary school. There's some real skill to actually growing something. and getting a substantial amount of food from the smallest area that you you know you when you haven't got loads of land to deal with um so yeah that knowledge is lost that that lifestyle is lost um i think only very few people even have some kind of semblance of it still nowadays um so yeah i think we are so dependent and yeah to be kind of brutally frank if something did happen like that there would be a lot of deaths there would just a lot of people would die um there wouldn't be enough food you know our whole food supply chain is just in time it runs on a just in time model so you know i remember being a kid and thinking in tesco's through those double doors was like mountains of sweets and food and what not but it's like there's some grapes maybe and a couple of other things that they keep on stock but otherwise it's all delivered and you know that's if one little thing happens in that whole chain then you get like what we had several months ago and um that could very easily happen again uh one thing that I've found quite interesting in doing this um course at the moment is looking at food supply chains and looking at this kind of there is a growing um emergence of local food and people getting more locally sourced and you know people investing into that and then the whole kind of thing is growing more that you know people that maybe produced a few little things here and there are now able to produce more because there's more people and interested in it and that kind of thing so yeah i don't basically i don't want you people to think that i'm just pessimistic about everything in that we just we're lost and we're hopeless and all that cuz i think there is a lot of good things that can be done um and yeah local food is definitely one step in the right direction i would say cuz it it's it's investing locally you're investing in what's around you so that when you know if everything fell apart or if there was a big catastrophe kind of event then um 
there would be some sort of safety net still. There would still be some, um, you know, going back to the infrastructure, and there would be a local infrastructure. There would be an infrastructure of food supply that's not going to be affected by coming over the channel and not be affected by what's grown in some other country and packaged in another country and then shipped to you. And, you know, so it, it gives you some independence again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what goes on, we're not even aware of. Like, I mean, I just hear things here and there, like how far food travels usually, how it actually travels often like around the world or it tra travels around the world a few times because it's being sent to certain places, maybe produced somewhere, then it's sent somewhere else for packaging and then it's sent for various places for distribution. So, mm. yeah, I mean, it's nice down here in Kent. Like I've connected with a few local producers like, Plund and De Man of, uh, Man of Farm and Pericourt Farm and I know more and more places around here like uh, Rebel Farmer I know if I wanted apples you can go to Pericourt Farm they grow the apples for Mr Kipling I huh. said Rudyard Kip Kipling in a previous interview but not Rudyard Kipling Mr Kipling <laughs> and uh <laughs> And they've got, you know, how many cows? Uh, 500 cows are plural in the manor farm. So, I mean, it's nice to know that because um, just to bring up another point, like Srila Prabhupada, um, the founder of Chara Viscon, then he said that society would collapse at some point. He said that, that it's not just, you know, us being paranoid or shaken up by coronavirus, that um, great personalities like him have said that a society that's based on um, exploiting the world and just, you know, ripping out resources basically for just making money, for making people rich. It can't be maintained. It's not sustainable. It's, it's impious. It's sinful. When people are living like a sinful life, then the reactions will come. If you do bad karmic activities, the reactions will come, which means collapse at some point. Yeah. And, and he said that I mean, that's one point that he said that society will collapse. And what are we going to do about that? What can we do about that? And also the point that he said that, but it won't, and he said that millions of people will come to Iskon's farm communities. And he said, but not because they'll be hungry, but because they'll be looking for jobs. Mm. So maybe could you say something about that? Any, any thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, I think like in terms of the, um, in terms of Prabhupada's statements about society collapsing, like, the way I interpret that, which, you know, obviously the, not the party line so much, but, uh, you know, the way I would interpret that would be that there'll still be uh, like the the 1% elite or the 0.5% elite or whatever it will be by then. There'll be a very small percentage of the world's population that will have a hugely concentrated amount of wealth by then, especially. And I think the middle class will have gone, basically, and it would just be, you know, mostly poor people, which is not far off from what it is now. Um, but yeah, so I think, yeah, I think in terms of a collapse, I think there would still be, there would still always be an elite strata of society. Um, and yeah, and I, th I think, yeah, the jobs would be the main thing. I think we're, they're, they're, people always find enough food. Like, God, I was watching this video the other day of um, some children in Bangladesh who were living like far below the poverty line. They were living along a railway track, you know, literally like 10 inches from a train as it went by. That was their living room kind of thing. Awful. And um, one of the kids would go looking for, they would sell bits of plastic and stuff that they found in like this crazy rubbish heap that was basically like a swamp. And um, yeah, there was other kids that would be like digging there for food and that kind of thing. And that, you know, it's, it's awful, but it also is kind of like, it's inspiring in a very sad way because it shows how determined when human life is challenged to that degree, it will still, it will still keep striving to live. So I think, you know, we may not be hungry, but that might not mean much. It might just mean that we just about survive, you know, and you look back in history and people were living awfully then as well, you know, in the Victorian era and stuff which is not that far a time ago and in this country people were living wretched lives and um but you know we're here now because those people still managed to eat sleep mate and 
<laughs> reproduce and like, have they more. Didn't die out, yeah. yeah, they didn't die out. So I think, you know, we may not be starving hungry, but I think usually real starvation only happens, not only happens, but from what I've seen, and I'm sure someone can correct me on this, but uh, from what I've seen, most real starvation happen when human greed is involved. You know, like the whole thing, there was a lot of uh, famines in India, which Churchill was linked to and stuff. And, you know, there's many around the world that I think have been political as well as natural disasters. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, in terms of starvation, yeah, we might we might be kind of borderline <laughs> if things were to... Yeah, and also this whole thing of collapse as well, like it would only be really through a war that things would really collapse. That's the, that's when you see a real kind of breakdown of society. Like the society can kind of patch itself together when there's like a coronavirus or something, you know, it's not that crazy really. When there's a war on, then things really fall apart. Like you see what's happened in Yemen, then you've got real starvation. Um, and yeah, so I'm trying to get back to your original point now. What was it? The, um, yeah, jobs. So, yeah, like Prabhupada said, that people would come to the farms for jobs and stuff. And, yeah, and I think that's kind of – it would it would take a whole shift in people's value system for that to be a reality. People aren't going to come to uh, an ISKCON farm or a Hare Krishna farm or even just some sort of spiritual community or any sort of economic job you know like a, a well you know even like a, they wouldn't really come for money they'll just come for work to survive kind of thing i i, I would imagine like uh, in that kind of situation um and i think that's where a lot of us are a little bit stuck in terms of starting a farm up is we don't have the right value system in place that we still kind of think that the real value lies in a position in a role in some meaningless money engine of a job <laughs> and um and or just the 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 day to day pleasures of you know living in this materialistic society you know i'm I'm guilty of it as well as much as anyone else um, but I think there at least needs to be that that desire for a change in value system like we need to really look at and I think that I think anyone spiritual or like all devotees do that anyway. They all kind of recognize that there's no real value in the material pursuit because it's, it's, it's doomed to end. <laughs> That's the whole thing of it. So, you know, the whole like gradual economic climb that is always promised it's, it's doomed to end at some point. And then those ends seem to be coming more and more often now every like decade, practically it used to be a bit more, sporadic now it's it's almost like clockwork like either yeah. either 2008 and <laughs> now and stuff you know so anyway yeah yeah i mean there's so many things i could say like i mean one thing is it's just about the economics of the world that we're living in at the moment that Srila Prabhupada said that real wealth is cows and grains mm. and for some of the people that hear this interview like i know some of the people who are listening right now that may sounds really strange or really archaic that you know what kind of caveman mentality would say that but like i've been reading some articles in the past about economics and how economics works in the in the world today and so much of it is just made up you know it's like governments just print money which doesn't really mean anything you know it doesn't necessarily have a gold standard there backing it up and anyway, what does gold mean? It's like, you know, if people, like Prabhupada said, real, food, real wealth is, is cows and grain. It's not gold. You're not going to eat gold. Um, and when we've seen collapses in the past, I was doing some research today and like various economic collapses that have happened in the last hundred years, then the value of money just disappears. Mm. And people are like taking uh, wheelbarrows full of money, you know, to buy, to buy a loaf of bread. Mm. So, I mean, I guess Prabhupada's establishing of farm communities and our doing that, working on these, trying to develop our own, like the Bhakti Project, 
or people that I know who are, who are developing projects is like in one sense to prepare and to have like a backup plan because what does money mean? And especially these days with like credit cards and stuff, it's like you go in, you don't even need a credit card now. Even I, I'm using it as well. You just go in with your phone and just like mm -hmm. ding, Google Pay. You don't even need a card. It's just like becoming more and more surreal, you know. So, yeah, I think having a backup plan is really important. I think establishing farm projects is like is like the first step in the way of doing that. Don't you think? Definitely, and I think um, you know, in terms of this whole value kind of where we place our value. Um, being able to see something real and going like I visited a farm last week, um, as, you know, for my course, I'm writing a little re report on one small scale farm. Um, I visited last week and just well, more than a little report, right? You're writing like, no, no, this one's only like, like 1500 words. That's so not too bad. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like, um, I went on to this farm and just, it's only like three acres and immediately you just feel this like, Oh wow. Yeah. God, this is really, peaceful and nice and enlivening to be around and i think hopefully there'll be more and more of those things and you know hopefully we can get something like that together um because i think it really attracts people and you know so just trying to kind of when you know some things you know it's like bad habit good habit thing you know if we have the bad habit as kind of your materialistic values and then you have the good habit as your kind of you know goodness and the spiritual values then um yeah, in terms of giving up a bad habit, you need to replace it with a good habit. So mm. having a model to actually go to, having something physical to visit, and that inspires you, that, that immediately will draw your attention away from that. And you will be starting to think, you know, oh, yeah, I do want to get out of this town or the city and try and get somewhere a bit more rural and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, but I think, you know, the real obstacle, I think, for everyone is finances. I think I think there would be a lot more people doing this kind of thing if there were a lot more fine, you know, if, if people weren't so poor, basically. <laughs> um, I know I would. Um, and I think, you know, it, that is going to, one thing I've been looking into lately is um, CSAs or com community supported agriculture, um, where you get a, a lot of people that will pull money together and invest in. Usually it's an existing farm, but there are examples where, uh, a community has come together and then bought some land and started farming there in the vicinity of the, a village or something or a town. Um, but I think, yeah, a community supported agriculture kind of thing would be amazing. I think, cause then, then you, what you're essentially doing is you're investing money. Um, and it's, it's kind of locked away money. The farm will have that money secured for the year or something, you know, it depends how you do it, but usually you'll kind of, pay a thing for a year and then the farm knows that it's got this much money for its budget to work with so then the, immediately for the farm it's like okay cool we don't need to worry about just making money because that's the problem as well is that so many farms are just businesses as well they're not um a more kind of romantic version of you know maybe what we think of as a farm they're just their industry um so yeah if you can have some financial security for a farm then then you you get a, a veg box a fruit and veg box or whatever is grown on that farm once a week um but yeah we were, i was looking into this the other day as well but then you'll get some points in the season where there isn't anything they might then some csas will buy in from um you know other areas and stuff um to still give you something but um i do think this is kind of a has a lot of potential if we were to try and start up a, um, you know, an ISCON farm or whatever, um, is if, if everyone can invest with, with no expectation of any other return than just food, um, which is a lot, a little bit difficult for a lot of people, but, um, but yeah, that's kind of, that's the reality is that money needs to be put down for something to start. And yeah, so. Otherwise, it would yeah. always be there. Yeah, it's like a catch-22 situation. I understand what you're saying about getting involved in agriculture or getting back to the land. If you don't have any money, then, I mean, you can buy land, but, you know, you need, like, 
especially where we are in southeast in Kent, it's extremely expensive, ten thousand pounds an acre, and it's not easy to find. You know, to buy something less than five, ten, twenty acres is very difficult to find. But I do, I do think though that um, where there's a will, there's a way. It's like there are different ways that you can connect to growing. It's like we had this project, we still have this project, Project Grow when we have a group of, I don't know how many devotees it is now, maybe 150. And it's all about starting to grow something at home, either in your garden or get an allotment or just grow something on your windowsill or just grow some edible flowers in a pot. And then it just starts and, then, and you develop like that. And I, I didn't tell you, but uh, two days ago, we were driving around between here and Canterbury looking out for land. And I met this lady I was just asking her, just in her house, I went to her house, she was in the garden, I said, do you know any land around here that's for sale? And she was talking about different pieces of the land. And she said, well, we have this big uh, garden, which I'm not using properly. And she says it's uh, one section of it is like 60 feet long. I said she has like deers calm and snails and stuff. She struggles with them. But she says, to be honest, she's not really fully utilizing it. Yeah. And she'd be happy to let us use it um, without paying or anything. So I'm going to go and speak to her again. So that was nice. So I, feel, I, I do feel like where there's a will, there's a way. And if you, if you take baby steps, but I think a big thing, like in terms of economics, limiting people, it's like um, accommodation. Yeah. Then if you could, if you could get some land and you could say, you're going to, you know, say you can get, I don't know, 10,000 pounds together or whatever, somebody, and then they can buy some piece of land, say an acre of land. If you could live on it, then it would make, you know, so much sense. So I think that's, in the UK, in England, it's very difficult because they really limit things. They really limit things with planning permission and yeah. they don't encourage people like they do in Wales or in other European countries. So that really limit, pulls people back, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, that's why we're seeing more and more kind of, urban growth and um you know um sorry i've just i scratched my leg a minute ago and i realized i scratched off a scab so it's a bit of blood that's <laughs> 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 why i keep going down here you need a plaster <laughs> probably um <laughs> what was i saying so the um yeah rural rural lively livelihoods or you know rural life is just that threat at the moment um, you know, it's difficult for people to make a living in rural areas and a lot of people don't want to commute loads and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's another aspect as well that, you know, along with accommodation, you know, because I think I think very few people are prepared. You know, you'll get your woofers and that kind of thing um, who will come and just want to just work and live simply and, um, you know, just get some food and that kind of thing. But, uh, Maddie. Hello, Maddie. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't think that's for everybody at all. Um, so yeah, I think finding something that's um, you know close. I do like close to like an urban centre where people can get jobs still and stuff. I think is a nice idea. I think for me at the moment, my kind of um, my goal to get going is just you know like this lady who's saying that she's got some land that we could use something just small that we can at the very least learn some skills on, I think would be a real first step. That's like a solid first step. Um, yeah. Cause then, yeah, if, even if we have to rent somewhere as well, like I think going to lots of bigger farms and just being like, do you have any small parcel of land that we could rent? Um, I'm trying yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to start trying as well in, in around here and stuff. Um, yeah, I think for anyone trying to start, like, I think that is kind of a good first step is just go to people with lots of land and be like, can I rent a small portion? You know, if you're doing it really kind of commercially, I think, you know, it'll be, um, was it you saying this or someone else the other day about like a couple of hundred pounds um, per acre per year? Yeah, I was just thinking that I was that I was speaking to an estate agent and they were saying that to rent um, pasture land is about a hundred pounds per acre per year. Yeah. And but obviously that rent... can be like, you know, 
100, 200 acres or something. So that's the thing. And also, and to rent land to grow vegetables on, like, I guess, yeah, like agricultural land to grow that you're going to be digging up and stuff, that's like three or four hundred pounds per yeah. acre per year. And see, that, that kind of thing isn't practical because. I mean, unless, unless you're going to be a commercial farmer and that's going to be your business because obviously you're going to have loads of overheads. Um, but I think if, you know, for us and anyone else who would want to start a, a farm community, I think to begin with, build the community and then the farm will come sort of like, you know, if you can, if you can get people who regularly meet at, like if you can just rent an acre from a farmer unofficially, you know, just, maybe you only have it for five years or a few years or whatever. But if you can just rent an acre, half an acre, even just a, like an allotment size piece of land. Um, and it would, yeah, if you can work out with someone you're a bit friendly with, it won't be too expensive and you can just start growing something, you know, you're not going to be able to uh, survive the apocalypse, but, uh, <laughs> but at least you're doing something that's enlivening and, you know, you, you have some food that you've got at the end of the day, and which is, you know, which is a lovely thing as well. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people can use their gardens and that kind of thing too. So, um, but yeah, I think building the community around one little portion of land is a nice idea. And then you kind of, you can meet there, you can start having, and then, and then, then you see who's serious and then you see if you're, you yourself are serious as well, you know, so mm -hmm. everyone's kind of um, commitment is tested a little bit, you know, are they coming? Are you coming every week? um is it actually flourishing is the little portion that you've got flourishing or is it being neglected in places and stuff like that um so i think yeah before any investment there needs to be something like that where it's like you see your stakeholders you see who's involved and then you see what you can actually create together um yeah and why is it that you want to say i know that we were at the farm that you just mentioned recently and to, that you were at yesterday, I think the rebel farmers place in, um, Brooke. And, um, you were, I got this photo of you in front of the field. I can just imagine that you're thinking about your wheat that you're, you're, you're desiring to grow in the future. Cause I know you've got a desire to like grow wheat. Why is it you want to do it? What is the feeling? Like when we talk about natures and stuff, like in my life, I've gone through so many different phases of thinking that just to use some Sanskrit terms that nobody will understand, like being Brahminical, like I like studying and learning things and learning, you know, verses or teaching. And then I've had phases where I kind of like being a leader or being a manager or developing projects, starting projects. I've also had phases or in the nature where I like doing hands on things, making things, doing artistic stuff. But what we're talking about is kind of a Vaisha nature, or like a farmer nature. So I'm attracted to that. But why? what are you attracted to about that? Why is it special? Like people would think, like, why do you want to get dirty? Why do you want to, like, be out in the cold? Why do you want to be a peasant, basically? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we've, gone, we've gone through hundreds yeah. of years of societies developing, so we don't have to get our hands dirty. So why do you want to, you know this human devolution you know where do you want to go back to our i think the thing is we're, we're, we've lost a lot with our progression as well and um that's what you get when you kind of are just digging and planting it's there's something kind of i don't want to say primal but you know there's something very kind of satisfying about just doing stuff with your hands that's for your health, for like, that's for the good of your family and out in nature and you've got fresh air and you're, you're tending to something that's, you know, it, it requires like a, a level of goodness involved. You know, you've got to maintain it. You've got to be there every day and put that energy into it, that kind of, um, cause you know, and if, you know, if you just shove a load of seeds in the ground and then leave it, it's not going to do much. You've got to actually tend to it and put your energy into it. Um, and putting your energy into something like that and seeing real fruits, you know, and real, um, real value, something that you can literally taste. Um, it's, it's a, it's a cure to the kind of very cerebral 
values that we have nowadays that it's 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 all in you know the value that we have nowadays is it's all smoke and mirrors like you were saying it's it's not really anything it's um you know you know you can obviously buy something real with it like a big house or whatever but a lot of those people that have bought a big house are still working like crazy and actually the real well, buying, it doesn't even mean that you buy it it means yeah. like you you're got a big it's not actually it's not actually yours like i was looking into getting a mortgage recently and you buy it but it's not yours it's the bank's all all it is is a, is, is a strict agreement that you're going to work for this number of years to this level as well you're not going to like start easing off when you get to 50 you're going to ease up because you've still got this much mortgage to pay um, and it's a whole it's just, book. when you start paying it when you start your mortgage repayments what you're paying off is not even the debt that you have. You're paying off the interest yeah. on that. It's like 90% yeah. interest, 10%. It's a whole kind of, the whole debt loan thing. It's like such an illusion, you know, that yeah. until you question it and you get into it, you don't actually realize that, like you said, it's really good. Um, I had to say a metaphor, like, you know, smoke and mirrors. It's like, where are we and what's happening and what mm -hmm. what is going on in society we don't actually see that's why i like that quote by power it's like show me the cows you know like show me the money show me the food show me the field show me the storeroom you know with the food in there so i'm not going to starve over the next year then i'll believe you, you know don't just give me like a number in yeah. my bank account well going back to your other question as well just a second ago that you're putting your faith in nature which is krishna's energy and it's you know it is indirect but you're you're, you're surrender it's a process of surrendering to krishna if you're doing it in the right consciousness otherwise you're just surrendering to some corporate you know institution that's just milking you basically um that's the reality is that you can surrender where do you surrender where are you going to choose to because like when you were saying about like why you do and you were talking about the different kind of natures being brahminical and and whatnot my real thing is that i just i crave independence like <laughs> i hate being dependent on someone i hate having a boss i hate like i really can't stand it um and the closest thing to independence you can have in this world is if you surrender to krishna otherwise you have to like i said surrender to a whole societal institution of debt and work and work not not like i'm not against work i'm just against meaningless work where it's like a lot of the times i'm not <laughs> there's so many rabbit holes like for one thing so many jobs are going to be done by robots in the near future because they're so meaningless that like data entry like that kind of thing you know uh just so many things so many things now you interact with like so many things you deal with every day like it's if you think about it nobody is involved you're just like dealing with a system on a computer nobody's involved in that and they try and arrange it in such a way that it's so difficult to phone somebody up these days and organize something it's like or chat online and even that is automated a lot of the time it's like a bot you know yeah so our, our whole world is becoming so impersonal that, <laughs> yeah like I said, everything can become automated all the tasks that are being done it's like we don't need a person to do it just give it to a robot to do yeah one little trick if you're dealing with call centers is to uh just put the number in to go through to sales and then it's about sorry i put, pressed the wrong number <laughs> <laughs> seriously it works every time you say you want to spend your money with them and they'll put you straight through and then you can say sorry <laughs> can you just put me through and then you'll usually jump the queue and that kind of thing so little tip uh, <laughs> but, like, uh, yeah it's like the english version of um in india there's like no queues for anything you just like everybody shoves in at the same time so like the english version of jumping the queue in india <laughs> ask for sales on the on the on the phone but yeah that's the thing yeah, they're so they're so eager to take your money but then when you're like dial in for a refund you'll be on like a long old wait and they'll put you they'll be like oh, actually we need to transfer you to this number just hold for two minutes 10 minutes later like then they'll just bounce you around or if you're trying to cancel and whatnot anyway um so i interrupt you you're talking about independence you like being you want to be independent and surrendering to krishna yeah i mean yeah i think mostly i made that point of just yeah that you can where do you want to surrender and um you know for me at the moment i'm just trying to kind of be in the mindset which i do forget regularly but the mindset of 
I want to do something for Krishna in this life. I want to, you know, provide something that future society will benefit from. And the only way I see that is through, at the very least, keeping the knowledge of kind of farming and small scale agriculture in this country alive or in other countries or wherever. Um, but, you know, ideally in some sort of community and like, you know, establishing a hub of something where people are actually going to continue coming to or yeah and i think that's kind of for me that's the kind of thing is like what do i want to leave behind because you know i haven't got long left really i'm only 30 but you know 10 years has flown by from 20 and the next 10 is going to feel like half of that and then so forth so it's, it's your whole life's going to fly by and it's like well, okay what did i what did i do with my time did i do something useful did i did i try and uplift people or did i just like take from them what I could, which is what our society is kind of about, is like, what can you get kind of thing? And, you know, I generalise our kind of society, but there are a lot of really good people as well, you know, maybe not devotees and stuff, but, yeah, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of philanthropic people and, what was that? It's the system that we're in. Yeah, the system, yeah, because I think there's a lot of really good people caught up in that system as well. But it's just such a, it's quite an alluring system as well. Even I kind of so many times start thinking, oh yeah, maybe I should just really go for it, try and get a decent paying job, save up, get a mortgage, just do the whole kind of standard thing. But um, yeah, it would give me some level of happiness, but I think real satisfaction is going to come from something a bit more deeper. I think that was a really nice point that you made about leaving something for the next generation and really, really relevant for these farm projects because, you know, I was living on in New Vajradam in Hungary for 10 years, a 600 acre farm and quite developed self-sufficiency. And these farm projects, it really is something that develops over generations. Yeah. Like once you have land and also it's like everything in the world, it's, it usually starts small, you know, mm. like I was doing some research recently about, um, Oh, what's the word? What's it called? When you go out onto the street and when people are selling stuff on the street, do you know what they're called? No, I can't think where you actually... I can't remember the word right now, but if somebody goes on the street, it's like a traditional thing in the UK. And they have a guy, like a rag and bone, rag and bone man, who's selling stuff on the street and people move around and they sell something. So, like, Marks and Spencers, and I can't remember the other names of the companies, but big, big companies, they just started like that. There was a guy, and he, and he had some flowers, and he would just walk around, anybody want any flowers, anybody want any flowers, and just sell them. Yeah. And then over, you know, decades, through generations, then it builds up, and then it becomes like a big firm, you know? Yeah, sustained so, hard work, basically, in the right yeah. direction is, yeah, is going to do it. <laughs> yeah. And like these farm projects, it's like you have land, you know, that's not going anywhere, you know, it's land and you can, you can build upon that literally, or you can just, you know, that can be something that you can pass on to, to future generations. And I was also thinking, you know, I've got two sons, you've got two girls that in terms of, you know, our own struggles financially, the way that we're raised these days is you go to school, you go to college, you go to university. You know, you're, you're studying your MA right now at university, then you get a good job, which we know that, you know, having a degree is no guarantee that you're going to get a good job these days. Um, and it's like everybody has to start from, from nothing. Like in the past, and what I'm thinking would be better for my children if they were, you know, wanted to, because it's up to them ultimately, is that you have land, you develop a business from it, which is like the most natural business, growing produce and selling it. Everybody needs food to build that up and then you engage your you get your little slaves to work on the land you know that's also useful and then in the future that's just something they take on you know there's already an income happening there's already a business you've already got the facilities yeah. it's like such more I, practical I think, thing yeah i do yeah i think that's lovely but i think also like the uh, the reality of farming is that you're never going to make much money unless you really you know standard kind of farming you don't make it's not a lucrative business at all. I mean, if you look at how much you spend on fresh fruits and vegetables, you're getting like six apples for like under two quid, you know, and it's like mm -hmm. those six apples, how much work has gone into picking them, growing them, the inputs that you've invested and everything. 
Um, but yeah, like there's definitely a business to be made. I think, you know, if you can, yeah, through like, through, yeah, using a diversified stuff. And anyway, that's kind of another topic altogether is like how to make a business out of a farm. But it's an interesting topic. Also, like the economics of scale, I'm sure, come into play, right? Mm -hmm. If you've got one acre, then if you've got like, you know, 100 acres and I mean, well, that's the thing. If you've, if you've got a small thing, it makes so much more sense to have a real diverse range of stuff you grow and then focus on a couple of like small cash crops like Ed focuses on um, microgreens now as like, you know, because you can, they're very low overheads. You can grow them quickly and easily all year round and people pay decent money for them. But if you're, if you've got a couple of acres and then you put it all into growing wheat, you're going to end up just like, okay, put all that money in. And I've got like 200 pounds for the year. <laughs> for like, it's, um, yeah, it's a bit disheartening. <laughs> so, so yeah. So go, so go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to wrap up my point. It was just kind of, yeah, a diverse farm if it's small. And I think that is the way to go is small, really. You know, you're not, not for financial reasons. If, you, if you're just getting into farming for financial reasons, the bigger, the better. I mean, I don't agree with that. But, you know, it's, that's, that's the reality is if you want to make money from a really big farm, then just do that. But, um, yeah, what were you going to say? I remember now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't remember what I was going to say. Yeah, it's a difficult world. Oh no, I was going to say that I'm just thinking about my thinking about it myself, farm projects, and I'm also going to be growing microgreens now, like the racks and stuff for here. I'm sorry, I'm growing wheat already, Virabhadra. I kind of preempted your your entrance onto the wheat um, arena. Um, but it is also it's like like you were saying, cash crops. That something Prabhupada was very critical of when he went to different countries and they were growing like rubber and Mauritius and stuff and sugarcane just to export it. Mm. They're not even growing and then they're buying in their own vegetables and fruits in such a climate as, as Mauritius. But it's like everybody has to pay their bills. I mean, this is why communism is quite good in one sense, that people are supported. Because, you know, say Ed is growing his microgreens and he can't grow wheat or he would like to grow wheat, but the, the income is so little. But then somebody's got to grow wheat. It's like it's not that nobody's going to grow wheat. So a farming always has to be supported in one way or another by the leaders of society, by the government or by the king. And I also I feel like that when I'm dealing with land or thinking about land, it's like in one sense you're vulnerable because you've invested in that area that land and you can't you're not flexible you know you can't move around you can't just sell it you can't you don't have any liquidity you're just it's invested in that land and if you can't get proper prices for what you're growing you're totally screwed as you said earlier it's like i mean you will have something to eat you know if you're going to grow wheat but um you know in terms of paying the bills then and 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 this point I was going to mention to you or to ask you about is that, as we were saying, society nothing is sustainable if it's not in line with the laws of Krishna. If it's not in line with the laws of nature or the laws of God, it just it can't maintain. It's mm -hmm. in the mode of passion or ignorance, which is described in the Bhagavad Gita. And it's only if you're living a pious life that that's maintainable. Mm -hmm. But the leaders are so important. It's explained that. You know, in the past, there were many pious kings who actually ruled huge portions of the world, or even the whole world, like emperors. And when they ruled, then it says that everybody was happy. Like the rainfall was regulated. People didn't even suffer mental agonies. And people didn't die untimely, usually. It's like so well organized. Sorry. Because if we don't... If we don't have real leaders, then how can anything be, you know, be working properly? Yeah, go ahead. Well, because I was thinking about the quote you sent me earlier of, um, about Pretty Maharaj. And um, I was trying to, I didn't have time to look in the Bhagavatam, but I was trying to remember the uh, pastime. And when he became emperor, was the first thing that he had to do or he did was um, 
deal with the agriculture because it was it was it him that went and like flattened the earth for agriculture yeah. yeah which is a really interesting point yeah that with you know like it, it, it does highlight the idea that you know you need there needs to be some economic stimulus um and you know in the t- in terms of like a, a religious life of dharma arta karma moksha um there first has to be dharma so in this case there was a dharmic king hey, tell um, us what dharma is because maybe i mean i think so, you say a lot of people know what dharma means the, the way i've understood dharma is um is is duty it's it's kind of it's higher duty it's it's doing the the higher duty in life basically the moral thing or the religious thing or um you know for devotees it would be that thing that's kind of in line with what krishna wants as well um so yudhishthira maharaj was a dharmic king he was a king that was devoted to the highest morality and the highest duty in life not just you know being king to enjoy himself um and the the vedic concept of a, a kind of complete life would be dharma arta karma and moksha so dharma duty so you do your duty and then from that duty arta happens so you get some wealth you get some economic maybe not wealth but you get some economic stability where you can then live peacefully that's actually all we're after like my dad says this interesting thing quite quite a few times to me he he used to be a banker in um he was the manager of emirates bank in the uk and um but he was always not yeah he went through a stage of being quite materialist nowadays he just he lives in a motor home and uh lives quite a simple life actually but um but yeah he would he would always tell me this thing of um that money is such a thing that if you want if you have enough you're fine if you want more than that it won't increase your happiness and if you be have you if just have a little bit under what you need then you struggle and then you'll suffer and stuff so you need that kind of that good point and that's for me what arta means is like it's that little band where it's the sweet spot basically you don't need more than that and isha panishad talks about that as well that we all have a quota in life of what we what we're going to get and you know some people might get a lot of opulence and a lot of wealth and stuff and that's their that's their thing but um i think for most of us we don't need lots we just need to be peaceful and feel respected in life um so yeah i for me that's what arta is and you know through doing your duty you get that respect and that kind of feeling of what a job's position uh, what a position in a job gives you of like i'm um, doing something useful when you're really not a lot of the time you're doing something damaging to the world but you're just kind of turning yourself blind to that because you don't want to think about the repercussions of what your job is doing um so yeah you do your duty you have economic stability and peace um and then from that dharma arta karma you can enjoy yourself you can be happy you can fulfill your material desires and then when you've done that you stop hankering for it anymore because you you've 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 enjoyed that thing that you were hankering for so so many years you you know and also if you're living this way already you're not going to have these crazy desires and stuff the whole time you're going to have simple desires anyway um but yeah and then on that kind of basis of a life you can have some sort of moksha which is liberation and you know that might take the you know in many different forms depending on what kind of thing you believe but you know for us that's that's where we can actually really focus on krishna we can become krishna conscious through this lifestyle so back to prithu maharaj that he was a dharmic king so he is he was establishing dharma and from what i've understood i might be completely wrong on this like the king is almost like the soul of society that like not quite but like just in this yeah let me just explain what i mean you can correct me after to improve like um you know like and it's almost society society and everything and the land is like his body so when when the king is dharmic then the whole land has to come in line with that dharmic king so it's interesting that the first thing he did was to start agriculture properly when it had been misdone previously with Venu Maharaj on the Danaf you call him Maharaj um king venu <laughs> um yeah so yeah and then from that then then he would perform sacrifices and he would do all these amazing things once he had established dharma and then the right 
value in life the right what was what was valuable and how much people should how much people should need wealth basically that was very badly <laughs> well, uh-huh. yeah, but you go on then yeah 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 it's a very very interesting topic like the relationship between leaders and people's wealth and agriculture it's like now we're talking about it, i'm realizing how, how important it is that if you don't have leaders that are dharmic as you said that are pious and know how to act and what are real values then everybody is is suffering like one of the quotes i sent to you i don't think i'll be able to put up right now but but shila papa is saying that in this age then um people are the leaders are so impious that people are victimized mm. and uh what did he say yeah it says this is not the case however in kali yuga for in kali yuga the kings and heads of states enjoy life at the cost of taxes exacted from the citizens such unfair taxation makes the people dishonest and the people try to hide their income in so many ways eventually the state will not be able to collect taxes and consequently will not be able to meet its huge military and administrative expenses everything will collapse and there will be chaos and disturbance all over the state so yeah just to get back to that point that when things are done nicely and piously then it's maintainable it's sustainable as everybody says these days but if it's impious then you know somebody's cheating somebody else then they're going to you know it's the cheaters and the cheated if they're over over taxing people the people are not are going to cheat to not pay the tax and then they're not going to be able to pay for their expenses and then the whole thing kind of crumbles so yeah leadership is extremely important yeah 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 there needs to be and that's why i think you know we need to um for ourselves at least start small and you know you know appoint leaders in projects that are good people basically <laughs> and like and then for cuz if you can find a real you know i think we've like a lot of us have probably met those people who are like really genuine leaders in life you know they just they they lead in in a real kind of magnetic way you know naturally they just kind of people want to follow them it's a really interesting energy to be around because yeah you know, i can think of a couple of people i know that are um you know shatrias you would call them you know like these kind of leaders like king kingly kind of st- type people and um there's just a natural gravitation for people to want to take shelter of them and for them just to give shelter by telling them what this is what we're going to do we're going to plan like this we're going to have it like that you know and if you can have one of those people empowered with finances <laughs> and spiritual knowledge then and most yeah these people that I'm thinking do have you know their devotees as well and but um you know if you can have a leader who's empowered with spiritual knowledge and who has the finances that can start something small then we can kind of grow from there um yeah yeah anyway the good news is that golden age is there it's happening it's in the scripture so it's like you know we're struggling to do something you know push something on and just you know it's tend to me to hear you know like be pushed back 10 centimeters let's just one centimeter in this direction but we have to have faith that it will happen you know it will happen by krishna's desire it will happen by lord chaitanya's desire and you know it will be will be lifted you know the 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 winds of krishna's mercy that change will will happen we just have to endeavor for the right for the right cause yeah. unfortunately I just like one last little thing. I think like, you know, society is changing as well. Like it may seem a bit imperceptible at times. But if you think like even like 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, you know, vegetarianism, veganism wasn't a, a thing. And now people are a lot more taking maybe just for kind of ultimately slightly selfish reasons so to protect the planet so then the the human race can still live and stuff like that but i think a lot of people are actually like no i just can't do that anymore it's like it's really there's a there's a compassionate feeling with a lot of people around it and you know i think there's a lot of that kind of happening that people are people are waking up and kind of improving like i'm i think both of us have 
are proof of that as well that you know we didn't just continue in the the way that society dictated to us we were like no let's figure this out a better way kind of thing and found something that resonated with us with christian consciousness so yeah <laughs> okay thank you we should finish it only because as far as i understand we can only upload this video if it's less than one hour long okay way. let's stop then <laughs> thank you so much for it was really nice i just love spending time with devotees and talking to them about just being with them anyway so thank you so much for yeah, spending your time with us it's nice to have your association thank you for your realizations and um you can't follow vira badger on instagram because he only opened his account 10 minutes ago and he's going to delete it after this <laughs> but you can follow him in real life and um he's in folkestone and he's working on the bhakti project with us and and lots of other wonderful things so thank you for your time thank and hope you will see everybody else next week on friday at 6 p.m okay take care thank you all the best hare krishna thank you for our viewers see you all soon